The Muslim Lawyers Association of Nigeria, Mulan, has accused the Nigerian Bar Association, MBA, of selective justice and a slant application of the rule of law in the decision to disinvite the Kaduna State Governor, Nasser El Rufai, as a speaker at its uh, coming annual general conference. The group therefore demanded that the NBA either cancel the session on which El Rufai was to speak or disinvite any speaker who has a record of human rights violation and disregard for the rule of law or has been indicted anywhere for acts of war or other despicable conduct. This comes as one of the two branches of the NBA in Kano State threatened to boycott the conference if Mr. El Rufai was not reinvited to the virtual meeting. Mulan stated its position through a statement signed by the group's president, Abdul Qadir Abdikhan, uh, titled, Justice is an Injustice. Human rights and the rule of law are colorblind, a victim call to the Nigerian Bar Association. And we're now joined by two legal practitioners, Abbas Idiong and Kabir Akimbolu. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure for having me on the program. I'm going to start with uh, Abbas Idiong. Do you agree with the Mulan's description that the NBA's decision amounts to an injustice? Honestly, I'm, I'm still scratching my head at the, at the decision of the NBA. Um, I know the NBA has had ups and downs through the years. I would think that this would represent a new low for the NBA because we're talking about the rule of law, and um, nobody seems to be talking about freedom of speech. I do think that uh, Nasser El Rufai does have his critics, and he's quite controversial, but he has an opinion, and um, he should be allowed to express that opinion, and he should be interrogated on that opinion. So I feel that, to some extent, the, the Mulan organization have a point. Uh, he should have been given fair hearing. He should have been brought in and um, quiz as to his handling of certain issues that people have uh, problems with. All right. Um, Mr. Akimbolo, I want, to, I want your thoughts. Some say the issues are being confused um, by those angered by the withdrawal of the invitation of Aero 5. Are they really? And, you know, what is your understanding of the issues here? So we're, we're sure exactly, you know, where these decisions are coming from. When we talk about the issues... Um, the, the problem we normally have is that issues like this, people pigeon only to religion. If we go to religion, we we'll, we'll miss it. But the issue here is let us be objective. And is supposed to be a, a guiding light to the nation in every country of the world. And it's supposed to be a progressive body. However, in situations like this, you cannot correct anything except you have taken a step. The best way to even correct, assume without conceding, that El Rufai, you know, has some issues. I agree that the Kaduna State government has some issues, the controversial framework, and so on and so forth, like uh, my learned friend has said. But when you look at it critically, it does not say that the man does not have the right of freedom of expression. In fact, if you had invited him and you have some misgivings, it is a better opportunity for you to now engage him. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Then you, you, you violate human rights, you disobey court order, you can now raise it and face him frontally and challenge him. The man may be able to answer, and it can even be a way for the man to change. But now you buy him, you say, cannot call me. I, I don't think there's any justification for that. The action is uh, very embarrassing and uh, very uncalled for. Seriously. And uh, back to um, Abbas Idiong. You know, your colleague there has just mentioned. Uh, about not, you know, focusing on religion. So I want to get you, your views on that. Does the matter have more to do with religion from the way it looks than a uh, pursuit of a better society? And of course, if you remember, there were allegations by the, uh, that the same NBA in 2008 also disinvited INEC chairman Morris Iwo over his conduct in the 2007 elections. Um, what, what are your thoughts uh, with regards to these? I sincerely hope that this has nothing to do with religion and ethnicity. Um, uh, way back when I was in law school, uh, El Rufai was invited to address lawyers on his activities as, as FCT minister. And then it was very controversial because he was demolishing people's houses and shops and throwing people out of uh, jobs. And when he walked in, the, the room was charged, was extremely tense. But by the time he left, he had 
change people's minds and had managed to give his own side of the story. Um, I also am aware that uh, Maurice Iwu was disinvited at some point in time, but this is all sentimental decisions. If a man has, uh, has c committed any crime, those are basically allegations, he should be given an opportunity to speak. I would uh, recommend strongly that El Rufai still give his speech, that he would have given at the NBA conference, and he should give it on the same day as the NBA conference will be holding. And we need to hear from Mel Rufai. I am not one of his greatest fans, but I think that there are certain issues that we can, we can hear from him on, and we can also uh, get to find the reasons what, uh, for, what he, for which he has done those things. All right. Kabira Kimbolu, uh, your thoughts on this? Some persons, of course, if you've been following the conversation, yes, have also, um, please hold on. Some persons have also called for the River State Governor, yes, some weekend, former President Tolusha Gobasanjo, to also be disinvited on the ground that they are also allegedly guilty of what the Kaduna State Governor is accused of. Um, do you agree with, with that call? I actually do. Do not agree with you if you are saying you want to disinvite anybody. And if the reason for disinviting Erufai is on the basis that the, the, the person uh, he, he has uh, violated human rights, then you will not have any moral justification or legal justification to invite uh, Wiki and Obasanjo because Obasanjo, more than anybody in this country, disobeyed uh, you know, court order. In fact, recently a judge of the Federal High Court said. This, the, the, his administration to account for the loot of Abacha. Abacha just said the judge was stupid. If somebody can say a judge is stupid and you are inviting him to come and give a talk on an NBA a platform, so and we get the you know you know demolish two houses without following through the procedure. We are all witnesses to this fact, and you are inviting them. Then you are now saying one person because he has done X Y Z, not the same allegation. You are not saying you are disinviting him. I think it's sheer hypocrisy and nothing more. Just like my learned friend has said, when I was in law school, so in 2002 or thereabout, Erufai was called. He was invited to come and speak to us about privatization. He was the DJ of privatization then. He came, by the time he came, we were criticizing him. He said so. By the time he left, he left up well informed and educated about the privatization. Now, if you are listening to this man, I don't think we will be be doing all these things. Some of the speakers that they are inviting, like Tony Blair was uh, indicted by a commission of inquiry in America for, give, for, for, for acting in tandem with the Bush to give wrong information that uh, there is a um, weapon of mass discussion in, in, in Iraq. It's a war crime suspect. You are inviting him. He, and, and these are the things. The rot in the NBA is more than all of this. They are not really tackling it. They are dealing with issues that are not even important. Even the president of the NBA is indicted and is facing a criminal charge. You are not saying re resign before you can go on. You cannot continue to lead us while you are You are not doing all these things. You are not saying the government. I don't think that we are correct. I don't think it is okay. About City Young, how strong of uh, an influence do you think the planned boycott of the conference by some branches of the NBA will have on its leadership? Well, this, this is a unique NBA conference. It's going to be a virtual one. Um, and ordinarily, I don't see how much of an influence the boycott would be. Um, but I just think it's a political statement, and I would like lawyers not to engage in political statements at this point in time. If we do have disagreements, the conference is the best way to ventilate those disagreements. We need to turn up en masse. We have structural issues within the NBA that need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed today. We have structural problems with this country that lawyers need to weigh in on. Um, we also have, like my colleague has said, um, you know, the, the leadership and the way the leadership emerges, we need to address those issues. So I think this is a, a good time for lawyers to come together as one body to speak on these issues, and of course, to find out what would be the best way to get speakers to address lawyers in future. Uh, do we look at their moral credentials? Do we look at their political antecedents? What, what would be the criteria? And who do we leave it to? Do we leave it to a group of 13 people, 15 people, 50 people? We need to look at all of this. So this is a good opportunity for lawyers to come together. And I would strongly um, 
urge all lawyers to attend this conference and uh, let's get this issue through. Of course, for a stronger MBA. I, I, I want you to go on before I move to Kabira Kingbolu. I want to know um, where you feel, you know, this outcry eventually came from. Because I need to understand, before the decision was made to disinvite uh, the Kaduna State Governor, I'm sure there must have been conversations about, you know, the other invited parties. Um, so what made, you know, the Kaduna State Governor, you know, special, you know, with the outcry? <clears throat> Well, I, I think it has to do with the Southern Kaduna issue. And uh, El Rufai had been on channels a few days previously. And he made no apologies over his handling of the Southern Kaduna issue. And I know people feel very strongly about what's happening in the Southern Kaduna, Kaduna. Some people have equated it to a genocide going on. And El Rufai has been quite um, open about his uh, feelings. About, you know, on the crisis, he said that it's the first time that you had um, a military presence, permanent military presence in Southern Kaduna, That's and true. also you've got a mobile police base in Southern Kaduna. So he is doing something about it, but people don't seem to think that he's doing enough. And you know, this this age of cancel culture, where you know public officers, officials are called out and the invitations are withdrawn, is it's, it's a global phenomenon. Um, El Rufai is his man. He has always been one not to shirk the opportunity to express his opinion. And, you know, um, the online uh, media seized up on this. 3,150 lawyers signed a petition on behalf of 85 to 100,000 other lawyers and um, petitioned and requested that El Rufai's invitation be withdrawn. And um, eventually, that was what was happened. Uh, that was what happened. But I think that it was a panicky reaction, and it shouldn't have happened. We shouldn't base these things on emotions and sentiments. Uh, El Rufai yeah. should have right. been allowed to speak because he is no better than other ones, other speakers uh, who have been invited who to been the invited. conference. All right, uh, Kabira Kimbolu. Um, lastly, just before we go, I want to get your thoughts um, on, you know, where the outcry mostly, you know, came from and, you know, the reaction by the NBA. Um, do you feel that it is because of the embarrassment to the president of uh, the Kaduna State Governor or is there something more that is attached to all of this? Hello? Uh well, I think there are some other things that might be attached because uh, we we are not following it strictly. We are not following it strictly as lawyers. As we must, um, you know, rise above all these narrow confines of, uh, you know, of thinking. We should think broadly, you know, so as to ensure that uh, things are done properly. When lawyers are being parochial in issues like this, what do you expect of people? There seems to be some difficulty. Uh, so, do we speak that the president should... All right. There seems to be some issue uh, having a strong connection with him there. I want to say a big thank you to um, Abbas Idiong and, of course, uh, Kabir Akinbolu. Thank you so much for joining us and having that very interesting conversation with us. We'd love, love to speak with you again. Thank you. And still on the breakfast and stories across Africa, Madagascar police have recaptured 11 out of 31 escaped prisoners one day after a breakout that ended in a deadly shootout, the Justice Ministry said on Monday. Police opened fire on scores of inmates trying to flee the Farafanga prison on, on Sunday, capturing 37 but killing 20 and winning 8 in the process. 31 managed to escape the prison located in the southeast of the Indian Ocean Island and were still on the run late on Sunday. The Justice Ministry said 11 of those escapees has since been caught and that one had been found dead, leaving 19 to account for. Many prison escapes are not, uh, or mass prison escapes rather, are not uncommon in Madagascar. In 2016, around 40 detainees broke out of a high security prison in Tolari, uh, the southern part of Madagascar. And also on African stories, uh, Sudan's economic woes, which fueled the overthrow of former President Omar al-Bashir last year, are driving a wedge between the military and civilian members of the transitional government that replaced him. 
criticism over the control of, of the economy still exercised uh, by a military a year after it agreed to ha share power with civilians has drawn an angry response from top commanders determined not to take the blame for the crisis. In his speech to troops on Monday, military leader General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan hit out at what he said was a campaign aimed at undermining the integrity of the armed forces. He was alluding to comments made by top civilians in the transitional government, Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok. Hamdok complained on Friday that his ministers had control over just 18% of the state sector, seriously hampering their efforts to rescue the economy. And now on the foreign scene, West African domestic workers desperate to return home since a chemical explosion tore through Beirut are finding themselves trapped by the stringent terms of Lebanon's kafala system, which grants employers an immense say over their lives. Thousands of domestic workers have been abandoned in the last few months by employers hard hit by an economic crisis compounded by the coronavirus pandemic, forcing many to sleep through or seek shelter in cramped and unsanitary quarters. According to the Middle East Eye, a Sierra Leonean woman who was imprisoned in the bathroom by her employer has been unable to retrieve her passport. A Ghanaian woman said she cannot leave the country un unless she returns to an employer who has not paid her in months. Meanwhile, Ghana and Nigeria have announced plans to repatriate their nationals. Still, Nigeria's ambassador to Lebanon told reporters that his embassy has been overwhelmed by sheer numbers wanting to return. Human Rights Watch have urged Lebanon's labor ministry to urgently adopt a new standard unified contract that respects and protects the rights of migrant domestic workers as a first step towards abolishing the abusive kafala system. And joining us from Lebanon is human rights activist Dara Fuel and Omotala Faumi, a social justice advocate. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with um, Omotola Faumi. I want to get your thoughts. Or, or quickly, please tell us about the kafala system and why it is important that is it is abolished. Thank you very much. The kafala system is a system that ties the migrant worker to the employee, the employer, which means that she's technically does not he or she does not exist outside of that employer so it's supposed to be a work contract but what's happening is that these migrant workers then get enslaved and so when they get to get into very difficult working conditions that they think oh this was not what i bargained for they can't leave they can't take their passports and decide to leave they need the permission of the employer to to release them so we've had many of them who have escaped from slave masters but cannot make the decision to leave yeah. because their, their contracts and their passports are tied to that employer. That's the kafala system. I think Dara can shed, shed more light on it. Yeah, and of course, you just mentioned slave masters now. I'm going to go to Dara now. Uh, since the last time you know, we spoke, what has happened with the girls who were stranded and in safe houses? Dara, can you, can you hear us? She's muted. All right. Um, we may want to, you know, come back to her in a bit. Um, Omotala, I think we can go on with Dara. you. Okay, Dara, go on, go on. I think we can uh, hear you now. Go ahead, please. Hi. Sorry. There was some technicality. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so since the last time I spoke with you, we had an extreme increase in numbers that are reaching out to me for humanitarian assistance. And it's starting to get very worrisome because we are reaching capacity. Um, the situation for the need for humanitarian relief is increasing. At the same time, the volunteers and the NGOs are not being able to respond as fast anymore. Um, Something that was really frustrating recently was there was supposed to be a flight. Uh, one flight happened on the 16th of August and 16 girls were, were on the flight list, but they were not able to actually enter the airplane. They were sent back to the houses. So there has been a lot of frustrations among them. Yesterday, I've been told by some girls that the flight they thought is going to happen this week has been canceled and there might be no flights until September. 
So this means the number of girls is just going to grow, the need is going to grow, and there is actually no sustainable solution for them right now. We can do the minimum, but um, for us as small organizations and volunteers, uh, it's getting really scary at the moment. Um, Motala, let's go back to you. Are you aware of, of the stranded Nigerian girls and are you aware of what has been done to get them back home? Yes, I'm, I'm very aware of several of them. Uh, and the, the, they should be the ones we have direct contact with as, I, as of today are about 200 and um, 72 of them are in separate houses. A lot of them, just like Dara said, are frustrated, stranded, and unable to come home. Some of them have made it home through several uh, evacuation flights arranged by the Nigerian government and Lebanese government and several of the partners on ground. But a large number of them are still either stranded, unable to, unable to get tickets, unable to do their COVID tests, unable to have access to basic things like food, clothing, shelter, and resources for that has to be funneled from different sources, channeled to them. So just like Dara said, a lot of the NGOs are reaching capacity. A lot of the NGOs are doing their best, but in a, in a, in a place where there's been a major explosion, the numbers have skyrocketed. So you have a lot of girls who probably had accommodation before, but their buildings were lost in the explosion. So their safe haven, has made them um, victims of the explosion and they, they need a new place to stay. So it's a lot, really. So not, not, a very, not a very good picture painted there. Um, back to Dara Foyle. I, I want to know about you know, how the crisis is affecting humanitarian efforts to assist these stranded girls. I mean, right now we have several crises happening at the same time. We have an extreme peak in the coronavirus because of the overwhelming numbers of people in hospitals, in safe houses, and even the Lebanese population being sheltered. So the virus is really going up now. And we have, through that, a new lockdown and a new curfew, meaning that NGOs or volunteers or people just wanting to help these girls cannot reach out to them after 6 p.m. So sometimes it's really frustrating and exhausting receiving messages at 8 p.m., 10 p.m. about medical emergencies, and we cannot go there without taking risk of, of breaking the law or getting questioned ourselves. At the same time, we have the financial crisis, which has been going on for months, and the current instability of the currency also makes it really hard for us to be able to afford help in a sustainable way, unless we get donations from outside Lebanon in US dollars. And then finally, as Omotala said, and as I can just repeat, the numbers are increasing. There is no sustainable solution. So we are really worried that eventually the, the aid that we can provide has to be selective. Like, okay, we can only help a number of girls with medical urgencies or that live in a really hard situation, but we cannot reach out to all of them. And this is something as a humanitarian worker and activist, a decision that you never want to do. I, I, I want to speak with um, Omotala now. Um, a, a lot, you know, and, you know, from even from this conversation, I was earlier going to ask, you know, why, you know, it's, it's mostly, you know, girls, you know, that we're having discussion about, you know, but I, I want to know a lot has been said about encouraging girls to refrain from leaving their various countries illegally. Uh, what do you think, you know, African governments may be missing? First, I think pe the people who recruit have a very highly organized informal system. And so they don't have a physical office you can go to. It's a friend of a friend who tells a friend about this opportunity. That's one. Two, like every human being, Everyone has a right to migrate for better economic opportunity. The problem with these girls is that they are lied to and they're not told the full picture of what they're getting into. Like I like to describe it, I describe it as a slave contract. How do you travel from Nigeria 
and travel to Lebanon to work for 16 to 18 hours, earning $150 or $200 a month. That's ridiculous. And that's with the threat of sexual harassment, emotional abuse. A lot of them are traumatized. So there needs to be a concerted effort by all governments. They need to check the borders. They need to, be, they need to tighten immigration processes. How are the people living? Who is checking them? I could speak specifically for the data that we collected at our organization. And we have a particular question there where we ask, how did you leave the airport? And all the girls, I mean all, when I speak of all, I'm speaking of over 700 girls who said, I paid 50,000 Naira at, for, they call it boarding fee. I paid 50,000 Naira, I paid 60,000 Naira. Some will tell you I paid 120,000 Naira. This is raw data with numbers and um, passport numbers attached to it. So there is something, for me, I think there's something wrong with immigration that needs to be looked into because obviously there is, there is, a, there is a relationship between the traffickers and the immigration authority. Next will be the campaign that NAPTIP does. They need to go down to the grassroots and they need to engage more partners beyond either what is done in the media or what is done um, at yeah. the exit point, which is the airport. If people are leaving, the only sign they see about the danger of trafficking is at the airport, then these girls are already on their way out. All right, hold on. All right, quickly. I just want to quickly go back to Dara Foyle. I, I want to know about the reaction of the uh, people of Lebanon to the stories of these girls that, that are stranded over there. Um, there is a lot of solidarity, especially among the younger generation, a lot of activists. And um, there are protests taking place in front of various embassies, especially Kenya, Gambia. And we have Lebanese activists uh, joining the protest and also trying to provide humanitarian aid to the women who camp outside of the embassy. At the same time, and Omotola already mentioned that a lot of girls are still being kicked out following after the explosion because their employers don't want to provide for them anymore. So we have two very extremes. We have the really supportive uh, activist community that really wants to help these women to go back home and are active also on social media. And then we have the people, the, the slave owners, the, the people who are taking advantage of these women that still kick them out on the streets, refuse to pay them salary. And what is even worse, we have the people who accuse them of stealing and reporting them to the police. So it's, it's really uh, two extremes that we have. But I think now at the moment, the media coverage is really good and people are starting to reflect on okay. what the kafala system is. Uh, systemic change is needed, but I do think Lebanon is uh, currently taking it step by step and we definitely have to continue Thank to support much. the women and their demands for freedom and return home and to work on the entire system per se. Thank you so much um, for this conversation and of course for shared, shedding more light on this uh, situation. Uh, Dara Fioil and uh, Omotala Faomi, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you.